<clears throat> with EOI. So. Welcome to the jungle. Yeah, the jungle indeed. <laughs> Uh, so I just pulled, as you saw, I just pulled Julia Solaris. Literally walking there. Walk off the show floor. I said, go tap that guy. Yeah. And we pulled you in. Yeah. There's no escaping our, our studio. Am I getting there. like a coffee or a Coke for yeah, this? I'm, buy I'm you just a kidding. Just kidding. The Costa Rica uh, Pavilion. Oh, that's amazing. Really that's a great coffee. tactic. <laughs> yeah. um, so you and I have actually never met in person, I don't no. think. No. Um, but we've communicated quite a bit. And I've obviously followed you over the years. Uh, you started Event Manager Blog, which you grew into a, a, a large organization when then you sold to Skift. And do you want to just give a quick rundown on your journey and how you got here? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm getting very old. So these intros are getting don't, longer don't and longer. Go there, okay? I, so, <laughs> I, I've got you by many years. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, I founded Event MB 15 years ago now, sold it last year, now Skift Meetings, so part of Skift. And uh, yeah, then I've been in event tech, working in uh, marketing strategy for uh, Swapcard and then Hopin last year. And now I'm uh, independent, do consultancy to event technology companies. And I just published today my uh, a new report on event technology. So a more strategic sort of, uh, you know, outlook on the industry and where, where things are going. So what are, what are some of the key takeaways from the report? And, and what surprised you and what, what confirmed what you were thinking? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot going on right now. And, um, you know, I looked at 50 different data points for sort of the industry outlook and where things are going. Um, you know, 70 to 75 percent in terms of capacity and revenue projected for Q4. Versus, versus pre-COVID? Versus 2019. Okay. Uh, but 20 percent higher costs. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a, the big deal, which uh, the big challenge we're dealing with as an industry. And are the organizers, uh, are they keeping their prices the same for admission or registration? Or so, they're not raising them in lockstep with the cost increases? So some are of they? them actually now are starting to do okay. that. So that's starting to happen, especially because there's there's a good demand in some verticals for for attending in person. Right. Associations. Um, and, you know, government, medical, pharma, it's like, you know, 110% capacity, like they're literally flooded by demand. Some others tech is struggling, obviously. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, again, it's the events industry is so fragmented. Yeah. And it's so tough to create sort of high level takeaways for this. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I saw that Skip published something uh, a couple of months ago that said uh, event attendance for shows is at about 65% of pre-COVID. Um, and Freeman came out with data that kind of correlated that. But the events are so, as you mentioned, fragmented and big. And I, I put up two slides in, a, in a, uh, two sessions I've done recently talking about the ROI of an event as being way more important than controlling costs. Because one event that I, I profile was the Collision Conference in Toronto, which you probably know, drew 40% more attendees than pre-COVID. They had, they went from like 25,000 to 35,000. So it shows that a, a good program, a show that has really good ROI, people will, will make time for it. They'll travel for it and they will probably pay for it. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I guess the element that we, we want to see here and what's happening with the future is, so there was a lot of virtual attendance. There's been a need to come back and meet in person. You know, are we still dealing with uh, the kind of like need to meet in person because we were locked down for so long? Mm -hmm. Or are we dealing with things as normal? My take is that we're still in for some level of uh, sort of uh, reassessing mm -hmm. and restructuring of everything where, you know, big demand will go down inevitably. Some meetings will be replaced by virtual inevitably. And hopefully, probably not in 2023, we'll see some hybrid as well coming up. Now, you've been relatively critical of a lot of event tech. Um, critical is maybe not the right word. Everybody is usually very flowery and effusive, and event tech is going to save the world. But you're, you're one of the people, and I'm another one too, who will, will call it like we see it. And you've written recently that there are a number of event tech companies that are not really focusing on on the user they're not really focusing on the ux the experience hasn't really elevated much in two years what what would you say are the biggest pet peeves of of people like yourself and how 
should an event tech company adapt to that? So, you know, and this is something that I dished out in my report quite extensively. So I did an overview of the past couple of years. Before I forget, how can people get access to that Yeah, report? just go to uh, insights.boldpush.com. Insights.boldpush.com. Yeah, okay. you can buy a copy of that. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's, you know, I feel that if we kept the pace that we had between March and May 2020, in terms of development of product development, I think we would be in a completely different scenario now. What happened though in May, June, 2020 is that the demand was so big that companies said, wait a minute, let's pause here. And let's start building on top of this commercially and started harvesting money. And um, yeah, eventually stopped developing products. We need better event technology, virtual, in-person, and still here at a show like this, who am I gonna meet? Where am I gonna go? Like these questions are so still unanswered by most event technology. And this is how actually we perceive events. We need to be present. We need to have more networking opportunities, connect with others. This is how we evaluate events. And event techs is still doing a poor job in connecting people, which is you know the big missing piece in both, virtual and in person. What do you think is the, is the biggest, uh easiest way for event tech to facilitate that well there's no i mean there, what, what's because there... let me back up a lot of a lot of event tech platforms have functionality to facilitate connections but it's just, it just doesn't seem to be used well or used properly or done from the standpoint of instead of here's the functionality thinking about how to get the users to embrace it and use it right is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a user experience piece that needs to get better. Um, there's also like, you know, I don't, I can't like, like in some cases, I'm not talking about all cases here. Right. It's always tough to generalize on these things, but in some cases it's like, okay, I need to scroll through a hundred people to find someone to meet. I mean, that's not a good experience, isn't it? Um, so tell me the top three people I need to meet, but you know, work it out with artificial intelligence do your magic in the background and just tell me where to go next who should, should meet first. So, you know, the problem is that also on the other side of things, there's a, a missing piece in terms of event design mm -hmm. and how intentional we are about networking. If you structure an event with back-to-back -back content, overwhelming people with like an hour long keynote session that people are just drained afterwards, and then you delegate the network into the alcohol at the end of the day, what do you expect? People are not gonna use the app for sure to network. What about, and this is going to sound overly simplistic, why can't we have a version of Bumble or Tinder for event networking? It's a simple model. They've got it set up well. You fill out your profile, swipe left, swipe right. You get a match, you start a conversation. So I remember 2013, I was in London at the time. And, uh, you know, it was a company that launched the Tinder for events and they came and pitched it to me. I was like, this is great. But then they struggled because... Most business events, right? The at the time they were perceived as business events, serious business is happening. We can't have any Tinder-like type of thing. Right. Now things are kind of different. We're like in the experience sort of uh, moment of the industry, mm -hmm. so I think we're more ready for something like that. But the problem with it is that to use something like that, you need some level of artificial intelligence slash data accessibility, and you know events work in silos. So it's very tough to get but that, that. But you would think with the amount of money that a lot of these tech companies, event tech companies have raised, that surely somebody could have put something like this together and said, you know what, let's give this a try. Even if it's not perfect, everybody knows the model. Everybody knows the swipe left, swipe right model. The problem is that, you know, there's a perception between event uh, owners, event organizers, that they own their attendees. They're not like free people that can go and decide where to go and how to move between different events. So, you know, to be able to implement something like that, you need to be able to be open as a system and be right. a LinkedIn, right? Where everybody's on it and I'm going to recommend you the top people to connect with. But you need a big ecosystem to have that network effect. In events, even an event like this, 12,000 people, it's not a lot of people. If you think in tech, tech uh, sort of a big numbers type of, uh, um, of uh, sort of- uh, But scheme. just from a UX standpoint, wouldn't, wouldn't it make your life easier? Oh yeah, totally. If, if, 
even oh. within IMEX, 12,000 people. Well, this is a great and you just fill Do what whatever you want, you want boom, with it. Swipe it. Yeah. We all know that this is what we need. Right. Like nobody is taking the step to make it happen on the tech side. And on your, like, even like if you think about Eventbrite, Hopin, Swapcard, they all add unique, unique profiles for one attendee attending different events. And it got so much friction, for lack of a better word, because of like data portability and silos and GDPR and data pro. I mean, this is like a nightmare. So if we don't fix that and we all agree on what's kind of like, how's the data policy gonna work? That's still, we gotta wait a little bit to see that. I think that's the, the Rosetta Stone. I think that's the key to unlocking all this because you're, pause for a second, bold push. Who's an ideal client for you and what type of service? I work provide? with event tech companies. IMAX is actually my client as well. Okay. So I work with them um, at their events. You know, I, I do marketing strategy for these companies, um, just mostly on the content side of things. That's my sweet spot. Obviously, I've been spent 15 years in content. So yeah, that's, that's me. Uh, so yeah, a lot of clients here. So if you had the ability to swipe and select for tech companies or companies that want to roll out a tech product, it could be Hyatt or Marriott that wants to do something within, within event tech. Totally. Wouldn't that be, rather than wandering around and bumping into people, that seems, yeah, I mean, that, I don't mean to be pushing the Tinder model, but- So I'm you're just, saying something interesting here because like I told you my, my focus is event tech companies, but you said, what if Marriott was actually looking for something like that? Like that's exactly the value, the serendipity, the planned serendipity part that I would need tech to help me with. Right. Because like we say, oh, we can't wait to go back to in person and finally meet serendipitously with people. But it's the worst experience ever. That, to that's go to overrated. Someone. The I mean, amount of is. serendipitous meeting that took place pre-COVID was was people meeting people they already knew. Exactly. But other than that, for an introvert person, for example, it's like you're essentially like, you know, bashing them yeah. to go outside of their comfort zone to yeah. go out and talk and introduce themselves to people. I mean, and not everybody has like 15,000 Twitter followers yeah. that is like people go to them. You know what I mean? Like they'll stop you while you're working for an interview. That doesn't happen to people. So, you know, got to be realistic with that. Yeah. Okay. Any, uh, any last minute insights or thoughts on where you think things are headed in our industry. Just be focused, be as focused as you can on, you know, your type of events, your vertical, whatever you want to call it, but be focused. Don't try to do too much right now because this is not the time to do too much. It's like the conditions, the market conditions are going to be rocky for a good I while. I agree. I've been saying that we're, um, I, I did a piece in LinkedIn recently on why the event industry may be heading for a recession and what to do about it because the economic indicators are there we're a lagging industry uh if we're having a good quarter it's because six months ago or a year ago people yeah. made business decisions to book it and so you know the economy turns and the industry doesn't feel it for six to nine months so i tend to agree with you where do you see things going on event tech companies do you i mean just looking around imex last year the amount of real estate occupied by event tech companies was probably five times as much as this year where do you think the the uh, the next big thing is going to be in? in I wouldn't say the tech space was bigger necessarily next year. It's always something that I took take a lot of uh, attention to. I asked the official. So you well, know, our perception, had a village last year. Yeah, but okay. like there weren't as many companies as you have this year. Okay, and, that's uh, fair. That's that. So we, there we are many more companies, but not as and not as big of a presence. Yeah, for it's each. a much bigger space in my pers. But our perception was what I'm trying to say. When I was in Frankfurt, for example, my perception was that it was definitely smaller than, you know, even Mimex Vegas. And it actually was larger when I asked right. the show. So, you know, we, I, I want to see that. But, you know, it's things are changing. There's going to be consolidation. There's going to be more acquisition. Right. So there's going to be more layoffs. Yeah. So that's for sure. I agree. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Julius. Thanks this is great. Me. Thanks. Yeah, sure. All right. I think we're done. Can we cut the uh, cut the feed?